Well, at Property Tribes, we're on a mission to help you live your best landlord life. And part of the way we do that is to bring you interviews with industry commentators um, and also people involved in the industry. And I'm delighted to be joined today by John Eastgate, who sells a marketing director of One Savings Bank, which is the overarching brand of Kent Reliance and Interbay. Vitalek products. Um, John, great to have you uh, joining us here Thank on you. Property Tribes TV. Um, I thought it'd be really interesting to talk to you because uh, Kent Reliance recently released the Buy to Let Britain report yep. and um, came up with some very uh, interesting observations about the future of Buy to Let and it was surprisingly optimistic. Yes, I, I think there's an element of, of turning a corner to it, I suppose, in as much as um, bike lets obviously had a few uh, travails of late through regulation and, and political intervention um, and that's driven some changes in, in arguably in the way the market operates mm -hmm. and, and I think what we saw with this report was, was potentially a, a flattening out and a slight upturn in the level of uh, landlord confidence and I think there's a lot of factors that have driven that mm -hmm. but the, f the fact that we seem to have bottomed out from all the, the headwinds that seem to have hit, hit the market in the last few years and, and shown that first sign of potentially an upturn mm -hmm. is something that's quite encouraging. I got the impression from the report that landlords perhaps thinking of an investment horizon of maybe 10 years should actually think longer term than that and push back even further and be prepared to stay in the sector for a longer time. Yeah, and I think I think I think that's fair, and I think also it reflects the view that um, the, the, the market is is professionalising, and so you know people enter into profession typically for the long term, sure, yeah. and so it, it's it's it, it's the last thing that the bike let market should be looked at is is an easy way to turn some quick money. There's a lot of commitment, there's a lot of effort, and it takes a long time to make those returns. So as with any business, the startup costs are usually something that has to be you know clawed back over the first few years. Mm -hmm. So anybody looking at it as short term investment is probably looking at it you know, is probably looking in the wrong place in terms of getting a, a you know a quick return. Mm -hmm. um, being a landlord, we firmly believe is about a, a commitment to the long term commitment to your tenants, commitments mm -hmm. looking after your property. Uh, and and that's why we have habitually targeted professional landlords as opposed to the more opportunity, opportunistic or, or accidental landlords. And there are, there are plenty of lenders out there who will do that and will do so very well. But that's never been an audience that we've uh, particularly sought. Mm. You mentioned that the government is trying to prof professionalise the sector. And I, I definitely believe that, that that's the way it's going. So um, do you think that we're seeing the death of the, the so-called amateur or dinner party landlord? I, I, yeah. It, it's, it's difficult to kind of be too extreme about was you know, the death of the sector or, or, or th I think there is definitely a trend towards the professionalisation of the sector. Mm -hmm. I don't know necessarily if that's something the government sought by design. I think the government's activities in relation to the buy to let sector have been driven largely by um, buying political favour, to be brutally honest. Yeah. However, I do think that um, the law of unintended consequences has applied quite favourably on this occasion, because actually, if we deliver a market in which we have more qualified, more committed landlords mm -hmm. who, who are, are more able to manage their properties, better equipped to understand the dynamics of um, and what it, need, what it means to be a landlord, and if that then produces better quality accommodation for tenants to, to live in, then I think that's, that's a general good for, for, for tenants, for landlords, for, for society, at the mm -hmm. risk of sounding too grand, but this is a, this is a very important societal issue. Um, and, and, and actually, if it takes also, on the other hand, if it takes people out of the market who were only otherwise going to go into it because they thought there's a few quid to be made mm -hmm. here, then equally that's a good thing because nobody wants to see people putting money into investments that they don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. Indeed. What were some of the other highlights um, from the report? Because one thing I noticed was that the report was very optimistic about the London property market in the long term, which is good news for me because I've got some <laughs> apartments and flats in London. So obviously um, over a very long time period, it, it can only be speculative. Um, we don't know how the market's going to perform, but your report was quite positive about London. So I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in the, the adage of form is temporary, class is forever. So London has always been the, 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 the market that 
feels the, the pain the most when things aren't going so well and, and typically you know, gains the most when, when it is going so well. But if you look at it in the long run, then the, the emphasis can't be too, you know, too strong on, on the long run. Mm -hmm. London does very well, always has done. And, and as we become a more urban society, and, the, and, and, and workers and commuters are, are increasingly based in large cities, then the long run for London always looks good. What I would say, and, and, this, and we echo this in the way in which we, we lend our money and our lending policies, is mm -hmm. I would take great care around, around new developments, around chrome and glass, for example. We've, uh, we and many other lenders indeed have always been a little bit suspicious around chrome and glass. There's too much of it goes up too quickly and, yeah. and, and becomes a... a you know, effectively a buy-to-let ghetto in many ways with, a, with an oversupply of, of rental properties. Mm -hmm. We're much more um, uh, attracted to uh, classical properties, uh, maybe converted houses, um, you know, more run-of-the-mill kind of accommodation rather mm -hmm. than something that's been purpose-built as a, as, a, as a new build flat, mm -hmm. for example. I'm so glad you said that because I've written an article that I think houses are actually becoming an endangered species mm -hmm. and particularly with the advent of build to rent which we know are going to be these glass and chrome blocks that are going to be uh, you know apartment living for probably young professionals and couples they're not going to appeal at all to families that want to you know a family home in a good school catchment area Absolutely not. so I can see moving forwards, and I have said this on Property Tribes, that houses are going to be an endangered species, and where there's scarcity, there's even more value. And, and I think the other thing is there's that families are often overlooked as, mm -hmm. as tenants. I mean, people make assumptions about it being young professionals and, and so on and so forth, or students or whatever, but actually families are tenants, and increasingly so families are tenants, because getting on the housing ladder and getting a mortgage and, uh, and all the rest of it and buying your own house is, isn't getting any easier. Mm -hmm. So uh, with families forming such a large proportion of the mm -hmm. tenant community, it's important to provide a, a product that meets their needs. Yeah, and there was a recent report, that, report out actually that said that families are the least hassle of any tenant demographic as well. So that's another good reason to uh, provide properties for them. Um, clearly we're hearing about landlords looking at different ways to mitigate the impact of Section 24. Um, do you have a view on going the limited company incorporated route? Um, there are some very clear benefits to going down the limited company uh, route, you know, the, the, in terms of the tax charges. Um, I'm not a tax qualified uh, individual, um, we would always encourage somebody to seek appropriate tax advice. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and your mortgage broker, however well qualified he or me, she may think they are, they are not either. So you shouldn't take advice from your mortgage broker, you should go to somebody suitable. Um, there are benefits to it and there are circumstances where it probably isn't worthwhile. What we have seen definitely is a shift towards new purchases being made through limited company vehicles. That's, that's undoubtedly a, a, a clear trend. We've also, uh, which I think is probably a little bit more interesting, is we, we've, we're starting to see the first few large portfolio landlords um, who've gone through the process of taking tax advice starting to switch their portfolios from being in their individual names into limited companies. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of complicated tax issues around that, around CGT and, the, and stamp duty. Um, uh, but it's, it's interesting that they're starting to switch their legacy portfolios into, into, mm -hmm. into limited companies. Mm -hmm. Complicated transactions, but we're starting to see that come through. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any particular strategy that works really well in the current market conditions? Um, I think this, if, I, if I was a landlord, and yep. I'm, I'm, I, I, can, I can speak without conflict because I'm not, <laughs> um, if I, I think I would, I would run my business like I would run any business or, or operate any business, which is I'd look after my customers and I'd, and I'd make sure that they were happy. So, so uh, this isn't my quote, but I, I like it, so I use it. I think landlords who look at their customers... Uh, so you look at their tenants as customers mm -hmm. and look at the money they have to spend on their property as an investment in their property, mm -hmm. that's the mindset that I think a landlord mm -hmm. should have. Mm -hmm. And uh, any landlord who's looking to cut costs to a minimum and sees a tenant just as somebody who happens to be paying the rent for the period of time they happen to be in the property is probably always going to come up or continuously come up against issues, hurdles, things that just inconvenience them. So make that little bit of extra investment up front mm -hmm. And I'm sure you'll get a longer uh, payoff in the long run. Mm. 
I'm so glad you said that because I agree 100% and I always say when you've let a property it's not a case of just sitting back and uh, you know watching the rent roll in. When you let the property that's actually the start of the process, it's not the end of the process because obviously landlords have over 160 government statutes and regulations to adhere to and you've, you've as you say you've got to um, fully understand your business and operate like a business and I think as we wind this up um, your report very much said that or suggested that it would be the professional and educated landlord who treated it as a business who could enjoy success uh, of buy to let in the future. Yeah absolutely and, and, and notwithstanding all that's happened in the buy to let market the, the buy to let investor who, who follows that strategy can still make a very decent return.